Stanford University. Welcome to the seminar on people, computers, and design. I'm Terry Winograd. Uh, this is the second of the series, and I just want a quick reminder, if you want to take it for credit, you need to pat, sign the sign-up sheet as it goes around, uh, or you can look on the web and look on the web page, uh, and you'll see a thing that says administrative details. Follow that link, and it'll give you all the details. If you're not taking it for credit, you're welcome to come attend anytime, watch it on video. It's all open. So glad to have you here. Um, Next week, we have Ross Bodick from Berkeley Computer Science, who's been working on new and interesting ways to uh, design programs and develop programs. He's, uh, when I sent out the email this week, I didn't yet have his abstract, but it is there now. So if you go to the website, you can uh, find his abstract. He is the first of three speakers this quarter from Berkeley. So I'll try to get them all out of the way before the big game or something. <laughs> but they do have some interesting stuff going on there. Um, so, and I'll ask, I actually have to run out. I'm in the middle of another meeting, but I didn't want to miss the opportunity to introduce Dave, uh, who is really one of my star graduate students and is now on his way off to become a professor, which is great. He's going to go to University of Puget Sound. Dave Akers um, has been doing work on better ways or more economical ways or new ways, all of the above, to do usability testing, and in particular on uh, the kinds of programs that we all use, like Photoshop and SketchUp and so on, he'll talk about. Um, the paper, he's finished his dissertation, almost. He, I still have to do some reading, but uh, <laughs> we're almost there. And um, the paper he wrote on it was actually, got a Best Paper Award at the Human Computer Interaction Conference last spring. Uh, and while I'm talking about it, I, is Robin here? No. I want to thank Robin Jeffries from Google, who also played a big role in, in doing the research. So, um, Having said that, I have to run back to my meeting, but I'm really pleased to have had Dave here as a student and look forward to seeing what it does in the future. Okay, great. Thank you, Terry. Um, so I'll just go ahead and begin. As soon as you're out of the way. <laughs> okay, so uh, word processors, image video editors, 3D modelers, and page layout applications, what do all of these examples have in common? They're all what I'll term creation-oriented software where the central goal of the software is the authoring of some content. How do we evaluate or characterize the usability of this kind of software? Is the software easy to learn? Is it efficient? Is it satisfying? Any one of these goals could be the most important, depending on the product. The traditional answer is to run a usability test, a laboratory usability test, such as the one pictured here, where we bring in participants one at a time into the laboratory, and we ask them to run through a set of tasks uh, while a human moderator is kind of watching over their shoulder and asking them questions as they go. The goal of this process being to document any difficulties that they had with the software. Um, because uh, laboratory space and one-on-one, -on -one, the, this requirement to have a moderator one-on-one -on -one working with each participant is very expensive, uh, necessarily, laboratory usability tests tend to be relatively small scale in terms of the number of participants that we run, uh, often fewer than 10 participants in an average laboratory usability study. And maybe that's not a problem because you have folks like uh, Jacob Nielsen who publish charts like this that show what they call the law of diminishing returns. It shows along the x-axis the number of users in the usability test and along the y-axis the percentage of usability problems found. And you see that there's this dramatic rise in the number of problems found in just the first five participants in a test. And so there's this rule of five that says that you can find 75% of the usability problems uh, with just the first five participants in the test. But this rule of five turns out not to hold for creation-oriented applications. So here below I have shown some data from a usability study that I ran with the Google SketchUp application uh, last summer. And SketchUp is a 3D modeling application that you guys may have played with. How many of you are familiar with Google SketchUp and have tried it? So a fair number of you. Uh, and what we did was we ran a usability study with 35 participants and then fit the data to the same mathematical model that J Jacob Nielsen had used. And you can see that it takes actually 30 users to find that same 75% of the problems for the given tasks. And so what's going on here? Why does this rule of thumb not hold for creation-oriented applications? 
And I want to suggest two possible reasons. One is that creation-oriented applications often give you the freedom to choose the content goal, what it is that you're trying to create. And so if I'm working with a photo editing application, I may be trying to build flyers and posters, digital artwork, or retouch digital, digital photographs. And depending on what goal I choose, I'm going to encounter different usability problems. Uh, you'll also find that creation-oriented applications usually give you some freedom over how to accomplish the goal. And so here I've shown you the toolbar palette for Photoshop uh, over the past 10 or so iterations. And you can see this explosion of tools as you go from left to right. It may seem like things get a little smaller here, but they're actually hiding more of these tools more and more with each iteration behind other tools. And so uh, there are, last time I checked, 10 different selection tools in Photoshop and five different major ways of modifying a selection. And so, of course, depending on what particular set of strategies you choose within this large set that's available to you, you're going to run into different problems. So we have a dilemma here, which is that we need a large number of participants in order to test these creation-oriented applications, but it's expensive to run a large number of participants through a test. And so what we need is effectively some way to reduce, to increase the effectiveness, the efficiency of our testing, and effectively increasing the scale that we can run it. OK, so let's look a little bit more closely at what makes testing so expensive um, in the traditional laboratory usability test. So there are kind of three phases. The first phase is recruiting participants. We have to pay them to show up to the laboratory, uh, compensate them for time and, and travel costs. And then there are expenses related to moderating the usability test. So that's actually running the test one-on-one. -on -one, and having that moderator there working one-on-one -on -one with each participant can be quite expensive. And then we have to analyze the results of the test, which usually involves going over the video of the test and making notes and figuring out what exactly were the difficulties that were encountered. And the problem here is that all three of these things are linear in the number of participants in the test. And since there are human beings involved, the factors here, the, the scaling factors here are quite high. It can cost thousands of dollars per participant to run a study. So this, my work and my dissertation work, has been about focusing on the moderation phase. We'd like to ultimately address all three of these phases, and I'll kind of come back to that at the end of the talk. Uh, but for now, let's look at this moderation phase and ask, what if we could automatically detect and characterize breakdowns that happen in creation-oriented software? And the observation here is if we could do this, if we could automatically detect and characterize breakdowns, we wouldn't have to have a human moderator watching over your shoulder one-on-one -on -one with each participant. It's possible that we could flatten out this particular line. If you had enough computers, you could effectively run everyone in parallel through the test. And if you could do this, you might also be able to reduce the evaluation costs by focusing the evaluator's attention on those particular parts of the video that are, that are worth watching, that include the breakdowns. OK, but how can we go about doing this for creation-oriented software? Suppose that we wanted to automatically detect and characterize these breakdowns. The fundamental insight of my dissertation is that backtracking events, such as undo, erase, abort, or cancel, could be effective indicators of usability problems. OK, and the idea is that we could, if we could automatically log these events in our application, record when they happen, then we could use the time-stamped events to index into rich contextual information such as screen capture video, a video of the participant's face perhaps, any audio commentary if they were thinking aloud while they were working. And then by indexing into this rich contextual information, you could actually characterize the nature of the troubles that they were having, the difficulties that they were having. OK, so to let you kind of wrap your head around this, I'm going to give you a demo um, with the Google SketchUp application. And I'm giving you this demo for kind of two reasons. One is to show you how backtracking events might form useful indicators of usability problems. And the other is that, uh, as Terry had mentioned at the beginning, SketchUp is one of the two test applications for the method when we were running experiments later on. So this will give the roughly half of you who haven't seen SketchUp a chance to understand how it works. Um, at least on a basic level. And for this demo, I'm going to be showing you how to build this simple, what we're calling a footbridge here, uh, with a curved top to it. Okay. So this is the SketchUp 
user interface. On the surface, it looks kind of like any 2D drawing application, but of course we're drawing in 3D here. So I'll draw a rectangle in three dimensions, and I'm going to use the orbit tool to move my camera around the space. So this is so far fairly standard for any 3D application. Now I'd like to give that rectangle some thickness, so I'm going to use what's called the push-pull tool to extrude any flat surface you can extrude and, and sketch up in this way. Now I want to build the feet to my footbridge, so I'm going to draw the footprint for one of the feet, and now I want them all to be the same shape. So I'm going to copy and paste them, and you notice that it snaps nicely into that corner. And I'm going to try to use that same trick and paste into the other corner, the opposite corner, but you notice I'm having trouble getting it to snap into that corner. So I put it approximately where I think it should be, and I move it around here, and you notice it's not quite a line, there's some space there. And so I'll instinctively undo, and then paste again, and this time, after some time, I may figure out that I can put it down and pick it up by the corresponding corner, and then it'll snap into place. And I'll use that same trick to snap the fourth rectangle into the corner. Now things are looking good, so I need to extrude these to form the actual physical feet. So I'll extrude them with that same push-pull tool, and I can align them to each other simply by dragging to another surface that I've already created. So you notice they're all the same height now. So this is looking pretty close, but there's that curved top that we needed to create to the footbridge. So I'll draw with the arc tool. I'm going to draw an arc, and my strategy is then going to be to sweep it across with that push-pull tool that I had earlier. But then I notice, oops, I actually drew it in the wrong plane. That's not the plane I wanted to draw that arc in, so I'll erase the arc. And then I'll draw it again, and this time as I draw it again, Notice that SketchUp gives me a choice. It's trying to infer which plane I want to draw in. It gives me a choice between this blue axis and the red axis. So I pick the blue axis. And now I have what I wanted, and I can then push-pull across, but oops, I grabbed the wrong surface. I actually grabbed the top of the, what is now a table. And so I undo that, and you'll notice this time that there's actually a hot spot. The hot spot for the cursor isn't where I thought it was, so I have to move it down a little bit, and then I can sweep it across and I've completed my, uh, my footbridge. Okay, so let's reflect on kind of what we saw in that short video example. There were three different difficulties that I had, and all three of those difficulties manifested in backtracking events. Now you may be saying, well, those difficulties seem like relatively minor kinds of problems. Uh, after all, I showed you ways to work around them fairly quickly. Um, but keep in mind that in our study, uh, that we ran with SketchUp, we saw people, novices in particular, cursing at SketchUp and at themselves sometimes uh, at their inability to work around these problems. And in particular, especially this difficulty snapping a rectangle to a corner, you'd see people doing this, trying to do this for 10 minutes and never getting past it. Um, so for an interface like SketchUp, where one of the design goals that the software team has uh, for SketchUp is that it can be learned within about 15 minutes of sitting down at the, at the software for the first time. These kinds of learning-related issues can still be considered usability problems and serious ones at that. Okay. So the claim I'm going to try to convince you of today, and hopefully by the end of this talk you'll believe, um, is that backtracking events can be effective indicators of usability problems and can yield a scalable alternative to traditional laboratory usability testing for these creation-oriented applications that I was talking about. Let me define a little bit what I mean by effective. Uh, by effective, so no detection technique that you would have that would automatically detect usability problems is going to be perfect. It's going to miss certain problems and it's going to raise certain false alarms. So we're going to measure effectiveness by a high percentage of problems found and a low percentage of false alarms relative to other ways of automatically detecting these, these problems. And then for scalability, I'm going to say that uh, it's scalable if we can automatically detect and characterize usability problems, which would facilitate this group testing that I was referring to earlier, so that we could get you know, 10, 15 people in a room simultaneously doing the test uh, for the same cost that, that we would have had before. Okay, uh, so an outline of the rest of the talk. Um, so we'll start out talking about the scalability question, and I'll show you 
that by pairing up participants in a retrospective commentary se session uh, centered around the screen capture video episodes, uh, you can actually, you're able to characterize usability problems. And I'll show you uh, a set of pilot experiments that we ran that, that yielded this technique. And then we'll move on to the question of effectiveness. And I'll uh, show you the results of an experiment. We ran an experiment with the Google SketchUp applications where we compared backtracking events as indicators of usability problems to self-reporting, where you just press a button every time you're frustrated as, you, as you're working. And in that experiment, uh, we found that 92% of the severe problems were detected by backtracking events, and with only a 27% false alarm rate among the, the episodes. And then we'll extend that result. We wondered whether that was result might have been specific to the SketchUp application. And so we ran the same experiment with the Adobe Photoshop application. And for the tasks that we picked in Photoshop, um, we found 74% of the severe problems with only a 13% false alarm rate. And then next I'll talk about some of the implications for usability evaluation practice. So what we did here was we ran a study comparing backtracking uh, events to the traditional usability testing model that I showed you at the beginning of the talk. And we actually had three uh, professional usability evaluators come in and do the evaluation for both conditions. And we learned a lot from, from running that study, uh, both sort of quantitatively in terms of cost effectiveness and qualitatively as well. And so that resulted in a set of recommendations for how this technique that I've developed could, could actually uh, fit into usability evaluation practice. And then finally, uh, this will deviate a little bit from, for those of you who have seen this talk before at my defense, uh, this last section is new. Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the lessons that we learned while developing this methodology. Of course, the research was focused on the methodology. Um, but what lessons did we learn about SketchUp and Photoshop specifically? And that may be of more interest to this crowd since you guys have have used SketchUp and or Photoshop. All right, so I'll start out talking about scalability. Um, so the first question is, we would need to find some way of capturing these backtracking events. In order to uh, get rid of the moderator having to watch you, we'd have to at least be able to detect when you were, when you were backtracking in the application. And so with both SketchUp and Photoshop, the surprise here is that we're able to do this without modifying the source code to either application. So it turns out you can do this in Google SketchUp with the Ruby API. There's an embedded Ruby API, and you can listen for backtracking events. And every time one happens, you can write a log message to a file. With Photoshop, it actually has a built-in history log, uh, which is for other purposes. It wasn't designed for, for this. But it turns out you can, mod you can just monitor this history log, and every time something gets written to it, and when a, an undo event happens or an erase event happens, you can record it this way. But of course, just being able to capture the fact that an undo happened doesn't tell you much about what problem was being experienced at the time. And so there are a set of questions that you might want to be able to answer in order to characterize the nature of the usability problem. This is what I meant by characterize earlier. So for instance, what happened before and after the backtracking event? What did the user say about what happened? Uh, what were the user's goals at the time that they were working? And did they find a way around the problem? Um, these are the kinds of things a usability evaluator would, in standard practice, want to know. And these are the kinds of questions that are relatively easy to answer in a, a traditional laboratory usability test, because you've got this moderator who's there. And the moderator can ask qu these questions as they go and try to understand better what, what the difficulty is. But of course, that doesn't scale. Just having this moderator, this is the problem that we're trying to, to overcome, having to have a moderator working one-on-one -on -one with each individual participant. What we'd like is some way to remove the moderator from the scene. So now, that, by the way, was really hard to do. I had to remove her both from the, the uh, mirror and the background and from the, the front of the image, if you, if you look there. Sorry. <laughs> I, get, I get really excited about that, that little part. I did use Photoshop. I, I also learned a lot about Photoshop during the process of the, the studies that I ran. So um, I was actually I was doing this during one of the usability tests, like while one of our professionals was was working with a participant, and I was doing this in the corner. And she's like, "What are you doing?" 
OK, so now we're going to play a game uh, to illustrate the results of a set of pilot studies that we ran to try to figure out how we could, how we could essentially get rid of the, the moderator in that scene. And the game is going to be called Name That Usability Problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a short episode of screen capture video of someone using uh, the SketchUp interface and experiencing some problem. Although it may not even be, be clear in the beginning that they're experiencing a problem. Uh, and then I want you to try to guess for those of you who haven't seen the talk before, uh, what, the, what the problem might be. Okay, so here's the video sequence. They're working on a scene. They pick the line tool, and they start drawing a line, and they move it up, and then they move it back down, and they move it up again. They're kind of moving it back and forth. They create the line. They erase it, and then they start drawing it over again in much the same way that they were before. So. Who here thinks they know what the problem might be that this user was experiencing while they were working? Anyone want to venture a guess? Yeah, go ahead. They want a straight line. Yeah, wanted a straight line. Okay, so that's one hypothesis. Any other? Maybe they wanted a different plane for the line. Yeah. Might ma wanted in a different plane. I know some particular height. Of a particular length. Okay. Or maybe they're trying to draw three D. Draw three D in what? Uh, line. Just not a line at all. Just some other. Other shape than 3D. Okay. Uh, I'll take one more suggestion and then. It's not clear that they have the mental model of how this application works, <coughs> mm -hmm. going up and giving them 3D as opposed to <coughs> just going across. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are all what I would say are reasonable hypotheses. None of these could be eliminated just from looking at the evidence that we have now. Um, so what we did, uh, in, in the first case, we just looked at the screen capture video, and that clearly wasn't enough from what you just experienced. There are, there are many different competing hypotheses that you could have. What if, you know, this, the simplest thing that we could do would be just to have them think aloud while they worked, right? And this is the same kind of thing that you'd see in a traditional laboratory usability test, but we're going to do it in parallel. So everyone in the room who's all taking this test simultaneously is going to be thinking aloud. And you get commentary that looked something like this. OK, now I want to draw a line. Let's see. Oh, this is frustrating. How am I supposed to know that? You know, and there are all these references, these pronouns that you don't know what they're referring to. Uh, and it's a little bit hard. to. It, it doesn't really add anything other than we know that there was a problem here. We didn't know for sure that there was a problem. Maybe they were just thinking about what they wanted to build. That was one hypothesis. Mm -hmm. You do, yeah. You know certain things, but you still don't know really what the problem might have been. Okay, so uh, it turned out there are two problems here with running the think aloud along with the screen capture. One was it's hard to remind people to think aloud effectively when there's a whole room full of people. If it was, if there was a moderator looking over your shoulder, she could just say, "Hey, you know, like remember when we trained you to think aloud to make sure you specify exactly what it is that you're trying to do and and all that and there was no way to intervene in that case. Uh, and then the other problem is that SketchUp, uh, as an interface, forces you to think in 3D. And so you're thinking often in terms of orientations and shapes and things like that. And it's, it's not really, you're not thinking in words. And so in think aloud commentary, usually uh, you look for cases where the words are already in your short-term memory and all you're doing is speaking them uh, as you go. So this didn't work. Um, and so the next thing we tried doing was moving it, moving the think aloud. We still needed some sort of commentary from the user. But moving it, rather than from be concurrent as they're working, moving it to a retrospective session, where we ask them a set of questions at the end, and they look at the video. And that way, at least, they could focus on the commentary, rather than having to balance their working on the tasks and their talking about their work on the tasks. So then uh, you'd get commentary that looked like this. And, and the, the questions that were supplied were automatically supplied by the computer. And they're the same for every single episode. So you just take an episode right around the undo or erase event and show it to them and then ask them these questions. So the computer would say, what events led you to erase something? Participant, I erased because it wasn't the right length. Computer, were you surprised by the software? And if so, how? Participant, yeah, I expected it would tell me the length. OK, now, now we've got like a, a clue. I think one of you over there had suspected that it was about the, the length of the line. Um, and then that is, in fact, what was going on. But we still don't know quite that much about it. Did you find a way around the problem? If so, how? Participant, no, not really. 
But we still don't know exactly like where were they looking for it to display the length. I expected it would tell me the length. And there's no way to follow up with this, because these are automatically generated questions, unless you've tried to build in some knowledge into the system. So the next thing we tried doing was pairing up the participants in the retrospective commentary. So they'd kind of interview each other about uh, the episodes. And they'd use these same three questions that I showed you on the previous slide as a basis for their discussions. So they'd start, the partner would say, what was going on here? Participant, oh, I raised the line because it wasn't the right length. We're still in the same place we were before. Partner, were you surprised by SketchUp? Participant, yeah, I expected it to tell me the length. We're still the same. We ha haven't learned anything new. But then the partner can ask, where did you think the length would be shown? Participant, oh, next to the line while I was drawing it, but I didn't see anything there. It was so frustrating. SketchUp would be a lot easier to use if it told you the measurements. And so now we actually have the information that we were looking for much more specifically. Uh, and this is an actual quote from one of the participants in one of our studies, this last part. And so now I'm going to ask you to watch this video one more time, and I'll direct your attention to the lower right-hand corner of the window as they're drawing the line, where it's actually showing them the length. But how many of you noticed that the length was being shown in the lower right-hand corner while I was working? So maybe a, a handful of you, but um, not very many. So it was a, it was a visibility issue. And, but it took us like all these iterations to kind of find a way of capturing what was going on. Okay, so in summary, we went through four of these pilot studies, and we ended up with this screen capture plus paired participant retrospective idea, which, which gave us the ability to characterize the breakdowns without having to have a moderator looking over your shoulder as you worked. And we coined the term backtracking analysis to refer to this last technique. This is what we ended up with. Um, and what all the studies for the rest of the talk will be discussing. And of course, like, uh, the idea of pairing up participants in a usability study is not new. Uh, plenty of people have done paired participant usability studies. There's all this work in paired programming and so on. But we did find a unique application for the technique in the context of the retrospective session of a usability test. Yeah? Why is that pairing so much different from having a moderator? Don't you still have to train them how to push this to each other? Um, there are, so, yeah, so the, there is a question of training, if, that, if that's the, the primary <laughs> direction of your question, or? It is more expensive, it is more expensive than what we had in the previous case where we were just having everyone do an automated retrospective commentary, right? You are having to pair up participants. Consider, though, that you're pairing up participants for only part of the test, and it's a, it's a fairly small part of the in entire length of the test. It's not, you're not pairing them up having someone work with you. When, when you have a moderator in a traditional laboratory test, it's for that whole time. They're busy working just with you. Uh, and what was, sorry, what was the other part of your question? Okay. Oh, training, right. Um, yeah, so we thought that we would have to train them uh, in, in order to get them to ask good questions. I and mean, it's, a, it's a reasonable proposal. Um, and in some cases, they definitely came short. You know, they would just let it fly. They'd be like, oh, well, OK. You, know, you didn't find a solution. And they wouldn't ask that follow-up question. We did train them in, in the process of giving them instructions. So, and we found that that about 30 seconds to one minute without any practice was enough to get something useful out of, out of the process. Um, could you do better? I'm sure. I'm sure you could do better. I'm sure we didn't try variations on the training materials that we provided. We didn't try to measure the effect. These were kind of informal pilot studies that, that led us to this. But it was clear that it was better than what we had. Yeah? yeah I was wondering what kind of users you used for this experiment. Uh, are the bonus users like the or the um, I'll get to that in some of the, the other studies. For the pilot studies, is roughly the same distribution that we had in the, in the main studies. It was. Uh, pretty evenly divided in experience from novices all the way up to, to experts. Um, and, and we did, in the pairing up of participants, we tried to pair up uh, the people who had the fewest episodes with the people who had the most episodes, just to keep the overall length of the, of the retrospective commentary kind of the same across each pair, if that makes sense. So next, let's move on to the question of effectiveness, now that we have a technique that we, we want to compare to something. And uh, I'll start out by observing that um, 
problems can take on multiple forms. And it's not clear that backtracking events would uh, occur associated with all these different types of problems. And so Norman and others have come up with lists like this of uh, the different uh, stages of action in which a problem can happen. So planning a sequence of actions, translating an intent into an action, physically executing an action, evaluating an action success. Uh, it's not clear that backtracking events would occur in all these different stages. And so if this were true, then many problems might be not indicated by backtracking events. We'd be missing those problems. It's also true that backtracking plays multiple roles in an application. So I've shown you in my little demo up front some examples where backtracking was used to recover from an error, a mistake that I made. But there's also cases when we use backtracking intentionally in order to learn the interface. We know we don't know how it works. We're just going to play with it, find out something new, and then backtrack because we never intended to commit that action. And so it provides kind of like a safety net. Uh, and then thirdly, we use backtracking as a transient way to explore design alternatives. So I might try out one shape for my model and decide I don't like it, back up, and then try something different. Um, and these latter two categories might indicate false alarms then from a usability perspective. They don't indicate that we're having trouble getting something done, but just that we either changed our mind or we're using backtracking as a, as a safety net. So with these two, this slide and the previous slide, we then <coughs> cast some doubt on on the initial claim, which is that backtracking events would provide effective indicators. And these are really empirical questions. And so we set out to compare backtracking analysis with another usability evaluation method. So the question was, which method to compare against? There are uh, techniques that rely on detecting statistical patterns in log events. Um, of which backtracking analysis would fall into this category. There are all these various techniques that have develop, been developed over the years. Uh, more recently, there have been, uh, have been research studies looking at physiological indicators of trouble. Uh, so they look for measures like changes in skin conductance, heart rate, brain waves, this kind of thing. Um, and this research is definitely promising. It's yet to mature at this point, and so uh, not clear whether we should compare it to something in that area. And then self reported difficulties. Uh, uh, let's see, Hartson and Castillo developed what's called the user reported critical incident technique in the late 1990s. And then Miranda Capra followed that up with a retrospective version of that technique, where the idea is you just press a button every time you have some difficulty. And we decided to compare ourselves with self-reported difficulties for a couple reasons. One is it's really easy to implement. Uh, just have a button in the corner of the interface that you, can, that you can use to report difficulties. And the other is that theoretically, any trouble that you're having, you could self-report, theoretically. Um, of course, there are, there are cases when you might not choose to report a problem. Uh, and, and we did find that in our studies. But we chose to compare to this technique. So we instrumented SketchUp um, to record the undo and erase events using the Ruby API that I mentioned earlier and self-reported issues uh, regarding with, with just a, a report an issue button that was up in the corner of the interface. And I'll give you an overview of the experimental design. We designed it to be a within subjects experiment. Um, what we did, we had 15 minutes of people using SketchUp to perform some tasks. And during that time, we recorded their undo, self-report, and erase events, and then extracted these short windows of 30 seconds, I think it was 30 seconds, around each event. Um, and these were short episodes of screen capture video, which we then showed them at the end in the paired, perspective, uh, uh, paired participant retrospective that I was mentioning earlier. And then we counterbalanced the order in which we presented them the episodes, uh, just so that we would avoid any learning effects. So we showed some of them undo, erase, self-report, then erase, undo, self-report, and so on. And what we were interested in is how many usability problems and what types of usability problems would be found by any individual method or combination of methods. So that's what's represented in this Venn diagram at the top. Okay. 
so we recruited 35 participants um, at, uh, in, this is out in Boulder, Colorado. This is a picture of the campus out there. Uh, and this addresses your question earlier about expertise. Um, so they, this is all self-reported in SketchUp, um, but they said 28% of them said they never used it before and so on. So you, we got a pretty even distribution of different expertise levels. Um, we also had 19 students and 16 professionals, so trying to balance things out. And here's a picture of the usability laboratory that we set up. Um, so we had uh, seven different computers set up in a room, all side by side. They were identically configured with SketchUp and screen capture recording software. And here, in a little bit more detail, is the uh, protocol that we use for the experiment. So we started out with, uh, the, the overall session was 90 minutes long. It started out with a 15-minute training session for SketchUp. And what we did was we showed them three new user videos uh, f off of the YouTube site. This is, these are watched by millions of people. Like, they, they have that number of hits. So we showed them those three new user videos. And that was to bring everyone up to kind of a common level, uh, just in case they'd never seen it before. We, we wanted to give them kind of just a, a head start. And then we trained them in self-reporting. Um, so that we followed the advice of Hartson and Castillo, who are the, the developers of the, this technique, in giving them examples of the kinds of things we'd want them to report, and emphasizing that the problems they were experiencing were not with them, but were with the software. Um, and that's, a, that's just a standard thing that, that you do in usability testing. Okay. And then we gave uh, people a chance to practice using SketchUp. If they learned all this new thing in the training session, they had 10 minutes in which just to explore and build whatever they wanted. And these are a couple of the, the models that they built. And then we gave uh, them the modeling tasks, um, which there were two different modeling tasks that they could get. One of them you'll recognize from the demo that I gave earlier is this, this footbridge. And if they finish that early, um, then we gave them a second phase to the task, which involved extending it and making three copies of it end to end to end. Um, and then randomly, like it was possible to get this task, but then the other half of the participants instead tried to attempt this other task, which we called the room task, in which they had to model this room and then place a pre-made bed component. They don't have to actually model the bed. Um, that would be a lot of work. And then if they finished that early, then they had to add shadows to their scene and split the bed into two single beds, which is actually a little bit tricky. Um, and the idea behind having the second phases is that we wanted experts to be kept busy during the session. It was no good to us if they finished in four minutes and, and then kind of sat there for the remainder of the, the session. And then we did the paired participant retrospective commentary in the way I've described before. And we asked them these three questions to guide their, their retrospectives. They're the same three questions. Describe what happened. Were there any surprises uh, that you encountered? And did you work around the problem? And if so, how? OK, so um, that was the experiment that we ran. And uh, I want to go over the results that we got. So um, this resulted in 353 episodes, which is an average of about 10, a little bit more than 10 per person um, in, the, in the test, since we have 35 participants. And by hand, a single researcher went through, and that was me, uh, went through and extracted 215 instances of usability problems from the 353 episodes. And let's pause for a moment here and ask, why are there so many fewer problem instances than episodes? And the main reason for that was the presence of false alarms in our data. 50% um, of the erase episodes represented false alarms. And there are two different varieties of that. One were temporary construction lines that people would draw. So if you want to facilitate alignment of two objects, take my first object, draw a line of length one foot, and then start drawing something out here that's one foot away from it. And then when I'm done drawing that thing out here, I can erase the line because I was just using it to offset. Does that make sense? And uh, cosmetic edges left over from the modeling process. You may have noticed these on the footbridge that I drew. There were some extra lines that were in there that you can erase at the end of the process. They're just kind of part of the process of modeling in SketchUp. And then 2% of self-report episodes, uh, accidental button clicks, like I accidentally hit the button. Yeah? If a user 
had problems that they caused them to go undo, and they also self-reported that they had a problem. Mm -hmm. Or is that count twice in the episode? Yes. Column? Yeah, it counts it twice in the in the episode column. We had to handle those carefully because they'd actually talk about it twice. They'd see two instances of it because there were two separate episodes that were overlapping. And so the second time they'd see it, they'd say, oh, yeah, 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 we've already talked about this. Like, <laughs> it was when I had this problem. And so we had to be careful in terms of looking at how much did those video episodes overlap? What would we have learned if we had just seen the, the section? Does that kind of make sense? It's a little tricky, but it's not worth it. Was that a significant factor? It was no. not a significant oh, and factor. It was, the the counting twice. it was a relatively small number of, uh, I don't remember, it was like 10, 20 percent or, or smaller. Um, overall. So that's a good question. Okay, um, so let's go back to this list that backtracking, the, the roles that backtracking could play. And I listed these three things here. The two types of false alarms that we encountered are not actually listed up here at all. So the first I'll refer to as reversing temporary actions. This idea uh, that I was creating these construction lines, and I never intended them to be part of the final model. I was going to erase them all along. Uh, and you might think of this as a kind of scaffolding behavior. I'm trying to uh, temporarily create some scaffolding that I'm later going to remove after I've used it. <coughs> and then reversing system actions, where the action wasn't my action at all. These extra lines that were there, it's not like I drew those lines. They were just a leftover of the natural modeling process in SketchUp. It's kind of like a, another example of a system action would be when uh, Microsoft Word tries to auto-correct for you the spelling of your word as you're typing. Um, and you might reverse that. You can actually undo that operation in Word and it'll go back. It'll say, oops, I didn't mean to do that for you. Um, so, but regarding these top, these two right here, learning and exploring design alternatives, we didn't see any examples of these. And the question is why? And I think with regards to learning, uh, re recall that we gave them this training of about 15 minutes in length, and then we let them explore for another 10 minutes on top of that. So by the time they got to the tasks part of the test, they were no longer interested in exploring the interface. They wanted to get something done with it. And then regarding exploring design alternatives, recall that we gave them very specific tasks. We said, build this particular footbridge and this particular room with these dimensions. So there wasn't a lot of freedom to explore different design alternatives. And I think that's a really important point in the design of the, the study, which reduced the number of false alarms that you get. If you tried to do this out in the real world, some of these things might not be true. It's just an observation. So. OK, so going back to the process, we then took the 215 problem instances. And some of them were instances of the same problem. We tried to be cautious here and trying to say that two things were the same. So we tried to only merge them into the same problem if they were, their differences were only superficial. So this left us with 95 usability problems. And we took these and we asked three SketchUp experts to rate each problem for two, along two different axes. One is the estimated frequency in an average application session, and the other is an estimated impact and persistence on the user. Is this the kind of thing that really messed them up or it's just a temporary thing that they immediately fixed? And we use this to rank each problem on a scale from 1 to 8. We combine these two to get this ranking. And here's a, a histogram of the rating. So most of them were in the mild category. We, we defined 1 or 2 as mild, 3 to 4 as medium, and then anything over 5 as severe, looking at the problems in each category. And then we computed an inner rater reliability measure. Uh, this is Kronbach's alpha. There's lots of different ways of doing this. Um, and it came out to 0 0.82, which indicated that the, the raters were uh, reaching agreement in, in most cases. OK, so here were the results in terms of problem counts found uh, by each method or combination of methods. And I'm going to quickly convert these into percentages so it's a little bit easier to read. But what, you know, so you have self-report, undo, and erase. It's immediately clear that erase wasn't as good as undo in terms of uh, detection, although there are a fair number that were encountered by all three. But what we're really interested in is backtracking events combined. So I'm going to move all the erase and combine it with the undo. And here are the numbers that we got. 
Um, so looking more closely at this data, you can see, and I've got the severity histogram here on the left linked up to this, you can see that backtracking events detected 78% of all the problems in the study. And actually, if you compare it, the total number of backtracking problems that were found to the total number of self-report problems, backtracking actually found more problems in the study. Right? Um, and 92% of the severe problems, it tended to be better at detecting those severe problems out here on the right uh, than, than at some, some of the minor ones. And you can use statistical techniques to estimate how these numbers would have varied if I'd had fewer participants in my study. So I had 35 participants in my study. What if I had 20? You know, maybe self-reporting found all of its problems right away in the first five participants, and then it was just repeating itself after that. Um, but this, these curves indicate otherwise, that in fact at all different scales, we would estimate that backtracking would slightly outperform self-report. Um, and there seems to be an advantage to combining both techniques. What you're learning from each technique is not the same. This is significant because we're running a within subject experiment. So if someone didn't report a problem that we found through backtracking analysis, you can say that that happened because, I mean, who knows exactly why it happened, why they didn't report it, but they could have. It wasn't a different person doing the self-reporting from the person doing the backtracking, which it would have been if we had run a between subjects study. So we were surprised uh, to see the, the strength of these results, that backtracking analysis would find such a high percentage of the, the problems in the study. And looking at back at this list of the types of problems that, uh, that you can have experience with, with one of these programs, uh, we had said before that many problems seem to be unlikely to be indicated by backtracking. But we actually found examples of all of these different things. So uh, regarding planning a sequence of actions. Sometimes a plan didn't work out. You'd have your initial plan of how you're going to build the model, and then you'd end up trying it, and the, you know what? Like, that wasn't the right way to build it, and so you'd backtrack a lot. Um, so we actually saw examples of that. Translating an intent into an action also, of course, we expected that, that you know, in some cases, not knowing the interface so well, your planned actions wouldn't match the way that an expert would, would uh, go through the same process. Physically executing an action, we saw examples of this all the time when someone's mouse slipped or they typed something wrong in a keyboard. And then evaluating an action success, we didn't think that we would necessarily find backtracking events uh, associated with, having, with uh, difficulty evaluating whether your action succeeded. But of course, this is really a cycle. As soon as you've finished evaluating an action success, that prepares you to execute the next action. And so you'd find these problems because I thought my scene was in a certain state, I then executed a next action, which I back had to undo because it, it wasn't the way I thought it was. Does that make sense? Okay. So next, we re-ran the same study with the Adobe Photoshop application to see whether we would get a kind of similar set of results or something completely different. And we ran this study at Stanford uh, just about a year ago. Um, and uh, in this case, we, recorded, we recruited a slightly smaller pool of 24 students, uh, and they were all Stanford students in this case. And in this case, there are a few more novices, but otherwise uh, kind of a similar distribution to, to what we had in the SketchUp study. So the experimental protocol that we had was almost identical. I just want to focus on two of the sections where there were some differences in the training that we provided and in the tasks. So for the training, what we did was we took um, the Adobe Photoshop Classroom in a book, um, which uh, in chapter one gives an introduction to tools, image adjustments, just basically gives you an overall sense of how Photoshop is laid out. What are these palettes? Uh, you know, where is my image? What, what is available? What are the different tools, most importantly, on the tool palette? Uh, what's available under the different menus? That kind of thing. And we made a 15-minute video. I actually put together this video, but it was based heavily on the chapter content. For the tasks, what we had was image editing tasks. Um, and so you take an, an original image here on the left of some uh, statue and some tulips. And then in the first phase, they would rotate and crop the image and remove a red color cast. And then the second phase, if they finished that, they would be asked to increase the saturation of the tulips, emphasize uh, highlights on the statue you can see up there, 
and then change a particular flower's color uh, from yellow to red. Okay. The second task uh, was a similar task to that one, but started with a portrait of a woman. In the first phase, um, they're asked to change the color of both eyes. Um, it's a kind of a subtle effect, but and I'm not even sure if you can see it under this lighting, but this, these are brown and these are blue. Um, and then brighten the teeth. Her teeth are a little stained. Um, she needed a visit to the dentist, so we, we had that. Um, and then if they finish that, I don't know why that image is up there, um, then they were asked to remove the earrings from the image and remove shadows under the eye and change the background color. That's the second phase. It should be pointed out that these are different goals than we had in the SketchUp study. So in the SketchUp study, they were building things from scratch. And here, they were modifying existing content. And that made erase, in particular, not a very good indicator uh, of usability problems because it almost never happened. People, for the most part, didn't use the erase command. OK, so uh, the process that we used to analyze the, the data was uh, the same as we did for SketchUp. And so we started with episodes, then to problem instances, and then to problems. So we had 107 problems at the end of this process. And here were the results. Um, I'm going to convert to percentages as I did before. And you can see that in this case, we found 61% of all problems and 74% of the severe problems. So, and if you notice here, this is 28% uniquely found by undo and 39% under self-report. So self-report, when you do the same analysis that I was doing before, does actually outperform backtracking. But again, the numbers are comparable, which surprised us. I would not have expected anything near to this. And again, there's an advantage to combining both of the techniques if you look at the top curve. OK, so let's talk about the implications. So this is the last part of the dissertation research. Um, what are the implications of this approach, backtracking analysis, for usability evaluation practice? And I think this is kind of the most interesting, ecologically valid part of the, the dissertation. OK, so there are three questions that we had here. Firstly, what types of problems does backtracking analysis find? We looked at severity, but that's kind of unsatisfying, right? You want to know something more about the types of problems, uh, maybe akin to that list that I showed before with planning strategies, find, uh, you know, uh, translating intent into action, executing physical actions, that kind of thing. Uh, and then we wanted to know how might backtracking analysis fit into usability evaluation practice. And this is more of a qualitative thing. So you know, we wanted to interview uh, some real practitioners to talk to them about how they would imagine using this or what parts of it they would use. And then lastly, how cost effective is the technique? Because that was kind of the whole basis for the studies that we were running. OK, for the first question, we'd like to compare to a gold standard. And self-reporting is known not to be a gold standard. You remember in those first studies, we found that there were certain problems that people didn't self-report. And so we know that it's not going to find everything. And, um, and so it's not, a, not necessarily a good example to pick for comparison. And then for the next two questions, we wanted to compare to a method in common practice. And so from both of these sets of, of uh, from these three questions, we decided to compare with traditional laboratory usability testing. So what we did was we had two conditions. This, in this case, we ran a between subjects experiment in two conditions. One, in the traditional condition, uh, we had, in both cases, we had 24 participants. Um, in the backtracking condition, we ran only two participants at a time, and that's just because we had limited laboratory space. Um, we could have run more participants uh, simultaneously if we had wanted. And then we had one professional test moderator that we hired to do the work of the, of the moderation in the, of running the study in the traditional condition. And then we had one moderator, who is me, who basically left the room in the case of the backtracking condition, was only there uh, to provide instructions to the overall group as a whole. And then we controlled for a number of factors. Um, we controlled for the prior expertise in Photoshop, their background, uh, the Photoshop training that we gave them, the total session length, the tasks, and most importantly, the usability evaluators were the same across both of these conditions. So the people who go through all those videos, it was no longer me doing that. It was the three people that we hired who are professional usability evaluators. So there are two sources of insight from the study. 
The first was a set of usability problem data that came out of the usability studies. And that includes problems found by each method and the severity ratings for the problems. And the second is interviews with the evaluators that we did at the end. And so I'll be reporting on both of these sources of data. Let's start with what types of problems this backtracking analysis find. So what I did, like I said, severity is one thing. You'd like to know, well, it's better at finding severe problems or non-severe problems. But we went beyond that, and we came up with a classification scheme in which there are five categories. And this is just sort of a pilot here, this part of the research. Um, if I were to do this over again, I would probably look to have multiple evaluators uh, go through and try to classify problems with the scheme to make sure they're all consistent and all that. Um, but this was just me doing this for, the, for this part. But we had forming strategies, difficulties finding features, difficulties choosing parameters for an action. So like I want to set the tolerance for, an, for the magic wand tool in Photoshop and I'm having trouble getting it right. Uh, executing actions, so actually physically executing the action with the mouse or the, or the keyboard. And then perceiving the state of the application. So this is kind of similar to that list that we'd gone through before. And what we found in comparison between traditional on the top and backtracking below, if you look at these first two categories here, traditional found a higher percentage of, well, first of all, it found problems that people had forming strategies when backtracking didn't find any for this particular study. And it found a higher percentage of problems related to discoverability of features, which makes sense because when would backtracking find an example of someone having trouble finding a feature. There is a case. I mean, there were, there were some cases here. Can anyone tell me an example of when? Yes, the wrong feature. You try yeah. it out and say, no, that's not it. Exactly. So it's the trial and error kind of thing, where I really don't know what it is I'm looking for. I'm just going to try a bunch of features out, and maybe that one of them does what I want it to do. Uh, whereas if I know I'm looking for this thing, and I know it's under that menu, but I can't remember where it is on the menu, that's never going to get caught by backtracking analysis, because you won't try something else mistakenly. Make sense? Um, we also interviewed the usability evaluators at the end of the, the usability test. And they claimed that, they all agreed that uh, backtracking analysis was particularly good for identifying problems that are difficult to articulate, for people to articulate. So people don't usually talk about actions that are almost reflex, like undo. This is what one of them said. Things that happen so fast, moderators might miss them, or participants don't remember clearly when asked. Backtracking analysis zeroes in on these actions, even though the hang-ups here lead to unfortunate chain reactions and break flow. They agreed also that backtracking analysis might be bad for identifying big picture kinds of problems. We're, I we're isolating these particular episodes and getting people to comment on the episodes. But some problems really involve the overall uh, picture that someone has, their mental model about the application as a whole. Watching a whole Think Aloud study also, you get a sense of whether the participant is going to read instructions first or dive in and rely on undo when they mess up, what their English and domain knowledge is like. It's hard to be sure about that stuff from small clips. So um, they're having trouble kind of putting together the big picture from this paired participant retrospective commentary that's isolated on, on specific episodes. So one recommendation that they had was to uh, possibly supplement the per episode commentary with a per study session commentary where you could ask them general questions about what were the hardest things for you? You know, what, you know, what were you most confused by during your, your time today? OK, so let's talk about how it might fit into usability evaluation practice. So um, one of them said that it really, to, to him, he wasn't so worried about cost effectiveness, finding episodes uh, as, uh, with uh, the lowest cost possible. He was worried about finding all the problems during the session and not missing anything. For him, as a usability evaluator, he's always worried about this. He doesn't want to miss anything. So he could imagine integrating backtracking analysis into a traditional usability evaluation. So you're running it with the moderator there the whole time. And then at the very end, in the retrospective part, and there's a retrospective part to a traditional laboratory usability test as well, you'd go back over just the undo and erase events, and you'd look at them, and then you'd use that to supplement the retrospective that you'd, you'd normally do. 
Um, they, all the evaluators were really excited about this idea of pairing up participants during the retrospectives. One of them said, a big problem with Think Aloud, and by that they mean traditional laboratory usability testing, is that people make up explanations to preserve their image of themselves as being competent and logical. One thing I like about backtracking is that it addresses this by pairing you up with another participant who has been through similar experiences. It's not so hard to admit that you got confused, especially because you're instantly confronted with video evidence. All right, so now let's talk about cost effectiveness, which is kind of that third question there. And I want to, uh, so you remember this slide from the beginning of the talk where we talked about the different phases of usability evaluation. And we have, with this dissertation work, we've addressed this question of moderation, effectively making it the same cost to have a large group come in and do the study as it would for a single person. And we've also somewhat reduced the cost of evaluation because we can focus their attention on the, the episodes. Um, so now I'm going to go over uh, what the actual costs, how to, how to look at the data. Um, and what we're going to do is have two axes here. One of them is cost along the x-axis, and the other is benefit. And we're going to plot the data from both studies in the same set of axes. Make sense? And the exact shape of the curves is not important for what I'm about to say for them. But there are a couple points I want you to notice. Backtracking analysis in the long run finds fewer problems. And that's because some problems it will never detect, no matter how many participants you run through the, the study. But it finds them more efficiently. So you notice that the benefit here is higher for backtracking analysis for small costs. Make sense? So what, what if we wanted to take this curve, this red curve, and move it up? Just simply move it up so that um, we get higher benefit for the same cost. We could consider combining it with any of these other techniques that we have. Right? So I'm using backtracking, uh, backtracking events as indicators. I could also use lag sequential analysis, Fisher cycles, any of these techniques. The second point I want to make is that there's still room to improve. So you look under the benefit here, and it still costs us considerable resources in order to find the problems that we do find. And that's because we've reduced moderation costs to effectively constant given enough computers. And uh, this is probably more like a step function because uh, you, you, have, you do have to have someone in the room to provide instructions. And it's going to get crazy if you have try to run a study with, with 50 people in the room simultaneously. But effectively, we, we drastically reduce the cost of moderation. But we still have the other two costs. So if we look at this original thing, we still have recruiting costs and evaluation costs. What can we do to reduce those? Well, recruiting, if you consider uh, various things that are out there, like um, image labeling games, where uh, in the ESP game, they use people playing a game online to actually accomplish some purpose. Um, and so there may be ways to get people to participate in a usability test without really coming into the laboratory and, uh, and, and being, you know, having to pay them to, to come into the laboratory. Perhaps there's a way to get people to do it as part of their normal work. And then in the evaluation side, uh, side of things, what if we could automatically identify false alarms? And what if we could group problems automatically? We had all these episodes, and someone had to, by hand, look at every single episode. What if we could group those episodes by the, the problem that was likely occurring? The first problem looks like a, a classification problem from a computer science standpoint, from like an artificial intelligence standpoint. The second problem looks like a clustering problem. So these are problems that we know we might be able to solve. Um, and maybe this is 20 years out, but if we could do it, we could eventually go from something that's currently linear, where the cost is linear in the number of participants, to something that is effectively linear in the number of problems but you can't get any better than that, right? You, somebody's going to have to look at all the problems in order to figure out what to do about them, whether, whether to try to fix them, and, and if so, how. And so the, the vision for this is that perhaps you could eventually have people out in, in the real world using this software in the wild. And you know, we wait a few days, and back come a set of episodes. I'm not sure exactly what form these would take. 
but depicting the most common problems. And, and you know, this would just sort of fundamentally change the way usability evaluation goes. In the near term, there are some limitations uh, and future work that um, we'd like to do to kind of start moving in that direction that I, that I spelled out. Um, the first is we've currently, consider the, the design stage here, we've currently been looking at released applications. SketchUp and Photoshop uh, are out in the world. And we see no reason, though, that it wouldn't also extend this technique of backtracking analysis, wouldn't also extend toward earlier prototypes. The only real restriction here is that you'd be able to instrument the application to record, undo, erase, these sorts of events. Secondly, let's look at the application type. I've focused so far on creation-oriented applications. Both of the examples are, are creation-oriented. Is it possible this might work for web search, um, where the back button is sort of like an undo, but it's also sort of not? And lastly, let's look at this, the study setting. So far, we've done all of our testing in the laboratory. If we really want to make this interesting, we might want to start out by seeing if there's a way to extend it to remote usability testing. Um, I want to emphasize that we think that the per paired participant uh, retrospective commentary is really critical in making this work. And so it's not clear whether this would work as well in a remote setting. We'd have to find some way to supplement what, what we get. All right, and lastly, I just want to run through a few usability lessons uh, that we learned about Photoshop. Um, I'm going to focus on Photoshop here because probably more of you have used Photoshop than SketchUp. So the first thing is that history interfaces are critical. Um, and by history interface, I mean the undo system itself. Um, a couple of uh, main problems that people had, confusing undo and step backward. So there's two different ways to undo in Photoshop. There's a multi-step undo and a single step undo. If you just hit Control-Z over and over again, it alternates between undo and redo. And it was amazing that people, even though they recognized that this is what it was doing, they knew. It was part of the training, in fact. It told them about this problem. But you're so wired to think that undo will undo multiple steps, because it does in most applications, that people weren't able to overcome this problem. It would just happen over and over and over again. Uh, and I don't know why this image is over on the left, but that is supposed to say <laughs> uh, running out of, of states in the history. So if I use the dodge tool, say, 20 times in a row, right, I'm just clicking with the dodge tool in Photoshop, which lightens a part of the image, um, I filled up my entire history state. It stores the last 20 things that you did. And so this can be a really serious problem because if you had something that was just 21 states back, there's no way to recover that. You can change the settings. You can say, oh, hey, Photoshop, like record the last 50 states, but you'll never get back what you lost um, from the state. So the point here is that history interfaces are critical. The problems that occur here are both very frequent because if you think about it, you use undo in combination with any of the tools that you use in Photoshop. Any problem you have with the dodge tool only can happen as often as you use the dodge tool. That is a ceiling, an upper bound on the, on the frequency for that problem. But undo is used in combination with anything. And then the problems that, you happen, that, that, that happen to you while you're using undo are particularly bad because you're already often trying to recover from some other problem. You've already made some other mistake, and now the history interface is getting in your way. Uh, parameter exploration can be really tedious. There are all these tolerances and brush sizes and radiuses and strengths and angles and things. And, and you just see these sequences of people trying one, nope, that didn't work, undo, try it again with a different thing. Uh, it's incredibly tedious. And there are ways, there has been a lot of research in the past 10 years or so to look at this problem of setting parameters. The last thing I wanted to point out is that predictability was often preferred among the users in our tests over the power of a tool. So here's one example. The clone tool simply copies one part of an image to another area. That's all it does. Very simple. And then the healing brush tool, what it does is, if you're trying to fix an imperfection, like you're trying to fix maybe you've got a scratch on your image, you just draw over it, and it automatically tries to figure out how to fix that, how to replace it with surrounding content. The problem was people, even experts who had been using the healing brush tool sometimes, 
would, would try it out in this study and they would just say, oh man, I can't predict what this is going to do. It would do something that wasn't quite right. It would get you 90% of the way, but it, it, it just wasn't predictable. Almost all of them ended up going back to this clone tool, which is this simple, dumb way of doing it. But it worked. It would, it would get you there eventually. Same kind of thing. The quick selection tool allows you to select regions simply by painting on the screen. But it would jump in unpredictable ways that people had trouble understanding exactly what was the model behind the tool. Lasso tool is very simple. I can just draw with it in a circle and select what I want. People would gravitate toward these tools. So there's just a, a real issue with predictability of, of the, the tools. So dumb but predictable and smart but unpredictable. And in these studies, at least, dumb but predictable was winning. So in conclusion, I hope I've convinced you that backtracking events can be effective indicators of usability problems and can yield a scalable alternative to traditional laboratory usability testing. Um, in summary, I'm going to skip through these slides so we have time to discuss. But this is the outline of the talk. And I wanted to acknowledge my advisor, my committee, and my funding source, Google, who uh, helped me in the last year, funded all of the, the work that I did. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. With the, sorry? Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely true. And there are there are plenty of applications out there that do record this kind of information. Plenty, you know, en enough to, to be able to look at it. That there is a question of privacy that you run into with sending back certain information. So uh, if I were sc sending back screenshots of your activity web browsing, there would be a, a potential problem. Uh, a lot of people would have a problem with it. So you, you do have to look at, at issues of privacy and logistics when you extend this out into the real world. But absolutely, that's, uh, that's an interesting direction. Any other? Yeah. About whether or how the kinds of usability issues that you can catch with this sort of method might play out into usefulness issues. You're using a tool that produces less undo. Does that mean you end up building a better design? Uh, that sort of thing. Um, so I'm not sure exactly. By, by usefulness, I mean. If I'm using uh, SketchUp, uh, and am I likely to produce better output <laughs> than if I'm using some yeah. other tool? Yeah. And in uh, creativity, it's of course very, in, in tools, you design to build something, there's a big issue about how you assess the quality of the product built. But the idea is if I'm using one CAD system, I'm right. supposed to be designing cars yeah, better yeah. than if I'm doing it by hand. I, I think mean, it's absolutely no. true that it changes the types of design. We were actually just talking about this at lunch before uh, coming down to the, the, the talk. And, and I think it's absolutely true that usability problems that may manifest themselves as undo may change you know, what it is that you think you can do with the tool. And you know, it turns out, like if, I, if every time I try to build, you know, auto automation's a really good example that w we talked about, like if you're building you wanted to build a spiral staircase, but man, I'm going to have to do that you know, one little step at a time, and I'm going to have to figure out the angle of rotation as I go around it. Uh, whereas you know, if, I, if I could accomplish in the tool some way to automate that and create the whole staircase all at once, maybe I'm build more interesting designs. So usefulness is definitely like, tied in with usability. Usually, uh, use, there's, there's various models for it, but like, usability can be broken down into utility and usefulness, or that there's but what you're saying is absolutely true. Does that answer the? Oh, I was just wondering if you, if you had any sort of speculations about um, yeah, what did you use how you they might be coupled to your particular approach. Could you prioritize yeah. it to highlight the issue? 
I want to do about um, I, to get people to um, self report or comment about their sort of design goal or, well, I want to do. I'm trying to think if there's ways of more automating information about the effect of the tool on. I think combining, yeah, absolutely, like combining this with other techniques that are more about need finding, for example, would be a really good idea. So, uh, you know, there's no reason you can't combine uh, the, the work that I did, which focuses on undo events, with something that's a self-reporting kind of technique where somebody says, hey, you know, wouldn't it be great if I had this application feature? And in reality, of course, like anything you do to usability test an application is one of like if you run one of these laboratory usability tests, you're going to be doing a lot of other things to measure usability. Like usability is a very broad topic, so that you know you'll be running, sending out questionnaires to your users. You'll be, uh, you know, collecting log data from the field. You'll be uh, looking, monitoring support forums where people are asking questions. Um, so I guess I would say my main answer, main answer to that is to combine what I did with these other things that are all already being done. Um, but you know whether undo would specifically uh, tell you anything. I, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. And we're gonna have to cut it here for time. So let's thank Dave. Feel free to come up and talk to me. I know we got cut off in the question period, so feel free to come up. I'll just stay. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.